In February 1981, an unknown composer named Mamoru Fujisawa was recording a percussion-centric, electro-pop minimalist album called Mkwaju, with a group called the Mkwaju Ensemble. The album's composition was largely influenced by the 1960s and 70s wave of American minimalists like Steve Reich and Terry Riley, whose 1969 LP A Rainbow in Curved Air Fujisawa cites as one of his earliest inspirations. Minimalism in music is often recognized through the prominent use of repetition in rhythmic and harmonic schemes with diverse influences encompassing jazz, African drumming, Indian classical, and Indonesian gamelan music all of which are plainly demonstrated in Umkwaju. Following the release of the album in June that year, the Umkwaju ensemble was forced to disband, citing financial troubles. The group would never reform. In December 2023, world-renowned composer Joe Hisaishi, having previously won seven Japanese Academy Awards for Best Music, finally received his first Golden Globe nomination for Best Original Score for his most recent film, The Boy and the Heron. These two men are actually the same man. Though Joe Hisaishi has always been a stage name, it's also a name synonymous with some of the greatest artistic achievements in filmmaking for the past 40 years. the films of animator and director Hayao Miyazaki. Over the course of 11 films, Hisaishi's scores have accompanied masterful flights of fancy with colorful harmony, lush and inventive orchestration, and indelible melodies, creating a Ghibli sound that has inspired audiences and artists for decades. Miyazaki's films vary widely in narrative and tone, and Hisaishi's scores have always evolved to match Miyazaki's vision. In his earlier scores, Hisaishi wears his minimalist influences plainly, almost quoting Terry Riley verbatim in his debut film score for Nausicaa. But this changed over time. The split between minimalist Hisaishi and film composer Hisaishi widened especially with Disney's English release of Laputa, Castle in the Sky. Disney's executives loved the film, but felt the 80s synth score was dated and too sparse for Western audiences in 1998. To their credit, instead of outright replacing Hisaishi's score, they asked him to rescore the entire film himself with a full orchestra, an opportunity Hisaishi jumped at. Hisaishi's scores, as with Miyazaki's films to that point, exhibited the oft-discussed Japanese concept of ma, or empty space. This ma is exactly the principle that made Disney uncomfortable, thinking of audiences of children and their parents stirring restlessly in the film's silence. Hisaishi said of his rescoring process, The Hollywood style of using music to introduce characters and explain what's on the screen is a method that I don't normally use in Japan, so I changed my usual approach to make the music more listener-friendly. This experience dramatically affected Hisaishi's scoring style moving forward, with some of his most stunning compositions following in the next decade. But whatever happened to Mkwaju? The OG fans want to know. Well, the truth is, the foundations of Mkwaju have never really left. Even as his music grew more and more cinematic, Hisaishi has always flirted with or downright reveled in minimalism. His original concert work albums named Minima Rhythm exemplify his retained interest in the musical form. In his film scores though, Hisaishi's minimalistic efforts have generally been restrained. There are moments throughout his filmography where his propensity for the style shines through, though it never outright overtakes the score.
that finally leads to Miyazaki's newest film, The Boy and the Heron, or its much more apt Japanese title, How Do You Live? After nearly 40 years of artistic collaboration, when Hisaishi first viewed the film in 2022, the animation was already nearly complete. I leave it all up to you, Miyazaki told him, entrusting Hisaishi with the score for his most personal film with almost no direction. The impetus for the score was just as personal. A short piano piece Hisaishi wrote as a present for Miyazaki's 81st birthday. Miyazaki, who's known to fixate on particular songs and pieces of music throughout the production of his films, adored the piece, telling the staff that it should be the main theme for the film. Seeing this as a sort of implicit direction for the film's score, Hisaishi decided to craft his score with a similar air of minimalistic simplicity. Hisaishi says, My focus was on how to create the world that Miyazaki is showing. So I took it as his personal history, and I didn't really overlay my own thoughts or my own personal history to his personal history. Whatever his stated intentions for the score, there's little denying that How Do You Live marks an important personal moment for Hisaishi as well. With the complete trust of his 40-year collaborator, the score for How Do You Live is a testament to Hisaishi's earliest inspirations and wholeheartedly embraces his compositional instincts as a minimalist in ways that none of his previous scores have. Mahito is plainly Miyazaki's self-insert protagonist. He shares the director's upbringing as the son of an airplane parts manufacturing father in Japan during World War II, and is evacuated from his home city after it was bombed. Hisaishi's score spends much of the first hour of the film either in small ensembles of piano and chamber strings or in complete silence. This approach lends to the retrospective nature of the film, which musically feels less like a period drama and more like a director wistfully recalling his past. The simple, solemn opening piano chords of Ask Me Why open the film, marking Mahito's mother Hisako's death during a hospital fire and the beginning of his new life in the countryside. Hisaishi has rarely used such simple harmony as the repeating 1-6-5-4 progression in G major he utilizes here, and it immediately emphasizes that the score won't be like his previous efforts with Miyazaki, which almost always open with a sweeping title sequence set to his music. In fact, only on the recurrence of Ask Me Why does a more traditional Hisaishian melody emerge when Mahito finds the copy of How Do You Live that his mother entrusted to him. With so much pent-up resentment towards his new pregnant stepmother Natsuko retained in the silence of the first 40 minutes, this broader melancholic theme acts as an emotional release for Mahito but in a much healthier way than the self-harm he inflicts earlier. Meanwhile, the heron is introduced with two simple pitches forming a descending melodic fourth on the piano. Each reappearance of the heron uses this fourth, eventually becoming a mocking bird call as its devious intentions become clearer and it tries to lure Mahito to the tower built by his granduncle. But Natsuko is lured instead, perhaps for the same reason as Mahito, to see her sister Hisako again. The interval evolves into a sneering frenzy of notes when Mahito and Kiriko enter the tower to rescue Natsuko, falling into the heron's trap, but still bookended by the fourth. As the film enters its latter half and Mahito enters the realm beneath the tower, Hisaishi invokes the style of sacred minimalism. Sacred minimalism employs the aesthetics of minimalism, but through the use of simple lyrical melodies and harmony inspired by the medieval and renaissance era, it evokes an air of mysticism. The music that underscores Mahito's discovery of the oceanic world bears particular resemblance to Arvo Pärt's Spiegel im Spiegel, or Mirror in the Mirror, an infinite reflection. This realm, however, is a distorted reflection of Mahito's home, 
and its harmonies depart from the tonal purity of Peart's work to convey that something isn't right here. A megalithic stone tomb calls ominously to Mahito through a golden gate as a pod of pelicans descend upon him. A young Kiriko reveals that almost all humans have died, leaving their souls to wander aimlessly on a sea of sailboats. Only this island remains, where Kiriko lives in the ruins of an enormous ship calling to mind the Ark and the Great Flood from the Book of Genesis. Here, Mahito is able to witness a strangely beautiful sort of motherhood as Kiriko cares for the Watawara, helping them grow strong enough to fly into the sky and be born into Mahito's world. The repetitious piano line is filled with lush, warm orchestral chords, signaling Mahito's newfound appreciation for the fragile beauty of bringing life into the world. But he's distraught as the pelicans from earlier suddenly appear to feast on the floating Watawara. Amidst the frenzy, Himi the Fire Maiden appears to fend off the pelicans with flame magic. La, 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 la. Himi's theme is introduced as a pair of female vocalists chant a tune that's both childishly playful and mournful. Its playful sadness comes into focus once it's revealed that Himi is actually Mahito's mother as a child, harnessing the power of fire, the thing that inevitably takes her life. The pathway to many times is connected through the great granduncle's tower, which one of the maids divulges was built around a giant meteorite that captivated him to no end. It's through the meteorite's will that the granduncle lures his descendants Hisako, Natsuko, and Mahito into the realm beneath the tower. The meteorite seems to exhibit an almost primal survival instinct for the world the great granduncle has created with its power. Coveting birth like that of the Watawara and Natsuko's child, and showing indifference to death, like that of the humans and the pelicans, as long as its existence is maintained. Himi and the parakeets refer to angering the stone when interrupting Natsuko's birth ritual in the delivery room, as the meteorite attempts to repel them with an electrical force. Finally, the granduncle introduces himself to Mahito in a dream. The granduncle frets over a precarious tower of blocks, telling Mahito that since they remained standing, the world would last another day. A marimba and piano play a single D in a repetitious, almost Morse code-like rhythm as the granduncle takes Mahito to the meteorite. Three widely voiced block chords played forcefully on the piano usher in a series of polyrhythmic string and wind lines playing fourths and fifths across octaves. calling to mind the sound of an orchestra tuning. Just as all great symphonies begin with tuning, all creation in the tower begins with the stone. The piano chords represent the stone, and by extension, the building blocks of all existence in the tower realm. Interestingly, each of the piano chords are voiced in second inversion. creating a sense of instability within the otherwise harmonically stable triads, much like the unstable world the grandfather has built with the meteorite's power. The harmony of this cue extends outward as dictated by the piano chords, much like the world expands as an extension of the meteorite's power. On the third iteration of these chords, the progression is altered, landing on an unresolved three chord, exemplifying the granduncle's plight that the world is incomplete and that he's grown too old to stabilize it any longer. He asks Mahito to become his successor, following the meteorite's will and adding to his tower to bring balance to the world. But Mahito rejects him. Having experienced the malice of the stones firsthand, he declares that a harmonious world could never be built upon stones meant for tombs, but rather needs to be built by wood, a material that once fostered life and growth. The granduncle seems pleased by Mahito's rejection, telling him his opinion is the exact reason he wants him as a successor before the dream ends. Interestingly, the next one to enter the granduncle's plane is the Parakeet King. Upon the Parakeet King's entrance, a solo trumpet performs the Morse code-like pattern from before. The prideful Parakeet King 
feels aptly represented by the trumpet as he stomps his way into Grand Uncle's paradise to curry favor with him. But this revelation is also important context in retrospect for the first time this music plays. If the block chords in the piano represent the meteorite and the Grand Uncle, then the constant rhythmic line underneath represents the interloper to the stone, in this case, the parakeet king. The trumpet represents the parakeet king, so the marimba and piano from earlier must also have an inherent connection to Mahito. Piano has accompanied Mahito's entire journey since the death of his mother, so the audience has been well acquainted with its musical association with him. But the marimba is different. In Mahito's meeting with the Grand Uncle, he espouses that the world must not be built by stone, but by wood, a worldview he gained through his travels with the heron, Kiriko, and Himi. This worldview is represented through the use of the wooden marimba, combining with the piano to form Mahito's resolve. Mahito reaches the Grand Uncle's paradise to rescue Himi and finally confront him face to face. Here, the Grand Uncle reveals that, in response to their conversation in Mahito's dream, he has scoured the universe for 13 stones free of malice to have Mahito build a new tower in his stead. Mahito, however, rebuts him again, saying that whether the stones are pure or not makes no difference, because he himself carries malice in his heart, and could thus never build a harmonious world without help from others. As the Grand Uncle pleads with him to still build the tower, the Parakeet King emerges. He impatiently stacks the stones himself, but they immediately begin to fall, initiating the collapse of the world. The Grand Uncle's theme plays one more time, once again featuring the ostinato in the piano and marimba. This final time, the orchestra fills the score with layered polyrhythms in the strings accompanied by swelling brass chords and a series of rapid intervals and fourths in the violins, hearkening back to the heron's motif as he leads Mahito and Himi to safety. In his final goodbye to his mother, the meteorite chords modulate into G major and shift to the opening chords of Ask Me Why, rendering a touching bookend to their unexpected reunion. Mahito leaves the tower with a renewed faith in living as he returns to his father and Natsuko, his new mother. I did not want to describe emotions or scenes through music. I wanted to be at a certain distance from the story and the characters, and I wanted to be in between the actual story and what we see on screen and the viewers in terms of writing the music. Hisaishi's approach in How Do You Live holds the story together in a way the film alone can't. The minimalism he employs is not proactive or reactive to the scenes he underscores, but still manages to elicit thought-provoking expansions of the story's core themes. And in returning to minimalism for perhaps his final film with Hayao Miyazaki, he's created the capstone work of his storied career in both the movie theater and the concert hall. Perhaps in the end, his attempts to make this a story only representative of Miyazaki's artistic life and ideals failed, because there's so much of his own creative history imbued with every note of this score. Two longtime collaborators, two masters of their artistic craft, and a story that came together to represent them both to its core. This film is a treasure. Now give Joe his damn Oscar. <laughs>